Darren, thank yes. you for coming to uh, talk with me today and talk with all of us. Uh, we just saw the trailer for the 21st, uh, 25th. 25th anniversary <laughs> re-release of Pi. Yeah. You, uh, that was 98 that it came out. It was your feature film debut. It kind of put you on the map. Yeah. And you shot it on 16 yeah. mil. You went back and remastered it for IMAX. Yeah, yeah. It's going to come out on Pi Day, March 14th, in a bunch of IMAX theaters around the world. What was the impetus to like go back to your first film? <laughs> and since we're talking about technology today, what, um, you know, an 8K on yeah, yeah. 16 mil is pretty unusual. Like, what did you like, yeah. discover in the process of re redoing it? Well, the story started 25 years ago. Um, young guy in Sundance, mm -hmm. and um, my hero was an independent filmmaker named Jim Jarmusch, who basically always got his rights back for his film, and yeah. I was like, absolutely, we need to get our rights back, this is mm -hmm. outrageous, you can't have yeah. them forever. And eventually the owner of the company that bought it was like fed up, he was like, all right, in 25 years. Okay. So time flies, and we knew it was coming back to us as the filmmakers, and um, we had originally shot it in 16-millimeter black-and-white reversal, which is a very strange film that was used mostly for titles because it's very contrasty, but we mm -hmm. like the look of it. Mm -hmm. It's actually the same film that goes through the camera is actually the... Um, becomes the positive. It's kind of like a Polaroid film. Right. And so after it's done, you sort of cut that together, and then you photograph it with 35 millimeter film, and then you release uh, off of that negative, you release prints. Mm -hmm. So it was at what anything anyone's ever seen, pretty much, including myself, is third generation down, like a third Xerox. Yeah. So we went back to the original 16 reversal, cleaned it up, and scanned it at 8K, and everyone was like, why? And I was like, because we're gonna go to IMAX with it. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the other thing is it was mixed in stereo, which was the only thing that exists now. And now, of course, they have these incredible surround system uh, called Atmos, where you could put sound all over with all of these channels. So we remixed the whole thing, yeah. brought in digital effects. And it was really interesting because in 25 years, it hasn't felt like my job has changed, but it's completely changed, because mm -hmm. at one point it was a purely photochemical manual job, which is how Pied was made right. in every essence of it. Yeah. Uh, the, it was actually the first film to ever be streamed on the internet, Pied. Oh, that's really? A, that's our historical... Uh, what was your moment. thinking behind that? Like, why did you... I think it got like three downloads, okay. and I was like, you guys are out of your mind, this, no <laughs> one's gonna download it, because it would take you like 18 uh -huh. hours to download it. Right. Like that. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and now being in a fully digital format, um, it just is amazing how much things have changed. Because if you remember, like back in the day, it was the only people that really had the gift of visual effects were George Lucas and Spielberg and mm -hmm. a small group coming out of ILM. Yeah. And now everyone has these incredible tools to, mm -hmm. uh, on their telephones and even more powerful yeah. tools on their desktops. Yeah. So when I think of your movies, I think first of this uh, heightened psychological intensity. It's, uh, it sometimes feels but sometimes it's also literally like kind of religious in its nature. You, you know, like Noah and Mother, there's this, this fervor. Um, and one thing I've noticed is uh, in my time in the, the film world, but also then my time in the tech world is, I meet people, filmmakers who make these movies that really disturb me. They're like, almost like nightmares that haunt me and they seem very normal. Thank you. When I meet, when I meet founders who do crazy things, I mean, they're very disturbing people. <laughs> like, what, what, what draws you to that kind of uh, material, like the, the darkness yeah. almost? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, it's funny. I have a, I'm friends with a lot of comedians, and they're always trying to encourage me to do a comedy because they're like, it's the, it's the opposite <laughs> uh -huh. of tragedy. It's just instead of su breathing out when you laugh, you suck in when you cry or something like that. But... Um, I think I had no money when I started out, and so I was like, well, I can't really do a chase scene, and I can't uh, do certain things, but I could, uh, instead of have bad guys, let the minds of these characters um, be their kind of antagonist. Mm -hmm. So it just, these internal struggles became a real focus of the work, and then I just kind of 
succeeded with that. You know, mm -hmm. one led to the, uh, there were many off ramps at different times when I could have done something else, and I was approached to do bigger films or more commercial films. But then I'd be like, oh. That film, The Wrestler, was successful enough. Uh, I'm going to try to make this crazy ballet movie. And then yeah. the ballet movie was crazy. I was like, oh, I'm going to make the biblical epic I've always wanted to make. Right. So it's just all, always I've been kind of um, slightly succeeding or failing upwards, whichever way you look at it. Is that what drew you um, to, for example, uh, I had read a story about how you saw the play that the whales adapted from like 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Requiem from a Dream was adapted from a novel. Did you immediately like see in these materials? You're like, okay, this is the type of thing that you know yeah. should be a movie. I don't know. They were very different paths. Requiem was written by my kind of hero, Hubert Selby Jr. The material was so similar to things I thought about that um, it was really difficult and took me a long time to get the courage to do it. Yeah. But The Whale was really, uh, I saw the play, was deeply moved by it, by these strange characters that um, I shouldn't really connect to. And um, it's weird. It, it went from 130 people uh, in that, in that uh, at Playwrights Horizon in New York, and you know we just did $30 million this week, and it's opened all over the world. We're number one on iTunes, which is crazy for an independent film. And so I... You, I think you have to follow the characters and that feeling, that emotion that, that you want to spend time with. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about evil founders, though. I'm kind of interested in that story. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get okay. to that. I, uh, I, yeah, congratulations on The Whale, multiple Oscar nominations. You just mentioned the $30 million in box office. Yeah. Uh, when we, I think about technological revolutions right now, people like to talk about the tools, AI, VFX, and things like that. But actually... Maybe the most prominent technological shift in film, filmmaking right now, is the rise of streaming. Mm. So it's really more a business model shift, uh, and, and the difference in the way that distribution of that material happens. But The Whale did kind of a conventional theatrical run. Yeah. A lot of people say, hey, movies like The Whale, you know, you, if you're not a comic book movie or a franchise like IP, yeah thing you can't really do the theatrical thing but 30 million is, is yeah, huge yeah. for a film um, of that nature what what's your reaction as a filmmaker to streaming will you always make your movies go through a theatrical run first like how, how do you think yeah. about that well I, I don't I, I think it's an exciting moment in time because of how distribution has changed and that there's so many ways to distribute films when pie was made mm -hmm. There was no way to get something out into the world unless you found a theatrical distributor and then mm. someone who would take on the VHS rights and they'd only do that if, or DVD might have just been starting. Right. Um, and now, you know, if I was a young filmmaker, there's so many different ways to tell stories. Yeah. Um, from short form yeah. to uh, even distributing yeah. long form instantaneously. So yeah. um, it's, I think that's really exciting. Uh, and that allows for just more stories, more types of stories, probably more niche type of stories, because you don't have to spend as much money as it took to to release things back then theatrically. I guess it's not that expensive anymore. It's just transmitting yeah. files. But so I think it's an exciting time to be a filmmaker. I'm not afraid of this. You know that if in the Hollywood people that are here, they everyone's afraid of the death of theatrical. I think theatrical is going to have its place. People like to go to see the movies, mm -hmm. just what type of movies we'll be playing. With The Whale, it was really important that I teamed up with A24 because their business model is based on theatrical. And a film that starts off with um, a man living with obesity, masturbating to porn, I just felt on a streaming service, people might change the channel. <laughs> But if they were in a movie theater, I kind of have their captive interest because ten minutes into it, you start start to fall in love with Charlie. And connect. So you'd you be know. surprised what people watch online. Terry. Exactly, <laughs> might be a good place for it. Um, I uh, your your answer actually uh, reminds me of something that is uh, that's always struck me about you uh, versus a lot of other creatives, which is you've always seemed very curious about and intrigued by new technology, not like threatened by it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the first time I met you was giving you a demo of like the Oculus Rift. Yeah. You were in pre-production on Mother. Yeah. I was like, here's a successful Hollywood, like why is he interested in VR? And then you, you played with the, the generative AI tools yeah. and um, you seem open-minded to it. Like what, have you always been that way with technology? Yeah. And I yeah. come from, I was the first kid to have a um, Apple 
to yeah. clone. I had the Franklin Ace 1000 wow. back in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Nice. I convinced my uh -huh. uh, public school teachers to spend 850 bucks on the Franklin yeah. Ace. And I just was always kind of a hacker and a gamer type of person. Could have yeah. very easily gone down that path. So I think gaming and VR are very related. And I think I've always been visually minded. And um, that's why uh, I'm so excited by all these new AI tools because of what you know, of how they open up what you can do. So you're not like, like, uh, like one argument about um, these new technologies in filmmaking is, well, you know, filmmaking's always had these seismic revolutions. We yeah. got sound, and then, you know, a bunch of people got put out of work, and, but other people got new, new jobs who were better with that. Then we had color film, yeah. like shifts like that. Do you view the current uh, moment as uh, being on that scale? And do you think it'll, like filmmaking will just survive and adapt just as it always has? Yeah, I mean, stories, of course, will continue to adapt. People love them. Uh, how they're created is definitely always changing. And just seeing the path between Pi and the 25th release, it's just insane how the tools are changing. Even Requiem for a Dream was one of the first films cut on an Avid. And the way we digitally cut the end of that movie would have taken an endless amount of time or, or a much longer time than we would have been allotted with our budget. So I think it will change the nature of how films look and how films are made. But I think it's, a, I think it's an unstoppable tool. It's coming. It's, it's right. like you can't put Photoshop back in the box once it's out. And right. it's beyond that. It's, it's, it yeah. does more... And, but I don't know, I, I couldn't sit here and answer what it means, but I know people are always going to come back to um, stories. And um, a friend of mine, Paul, talked about getting, that it's not about spectacle anymore, because spectacle is fully available to mm -hmm. everyone at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think spectacle becomes less interesting in the same way the crazy visual effects in Transformers 10 it doesn't really move you in the same right. way like just seeing you know a lightsaber for the first time moved you it's hard to really really blow people away but you can always blow people away with emotion and stories mm -hmm. so that's where it's going to return um and visually how you present that is is really exciting um we used to uh think you know the the vision of the future that technologists always imagine that we always thought about in sci-fi was the robots will take over these mundane <laughs> jobs like they'll you know like cook and clean and we'll right. be free as humans to just be creative we'll just sit around writing poetry making right, movies right. or whatnot and I think maybe something that a lot of people have been taken aback by over the past year is like wait a minute yeah a lot of the big advances in AI are actually are in the creative fields. Yeah. Like I still have to ha -ha. cook and clean myself, but now this this like AI thing can spit out a yeah. a poem, or it can make a you know a beautiful painting in any style I want. And we've been like starting to see filmmaking yeah. tools where you just like type out like I want a movie or this. And yeah. um, I think this wasn't kind of the future people were anticipating. Right. But you, you're like such a success. You're an Academy Award nominated uh, filmmaker. You're a professional that makes a living. How do you think that like, well, how do you personally take right. this advance? And how do you think people will feel about, you know, competing with I, like... I don't know. I haven't yet field. seen... Yeah. I, I haven't yet seen the, the machines figure out how to surprise and how to make mm -hmm. special turns and twists. Yeah. And um, there's still, um, and all the kind of models I've been playing with, you can have amazing results, but how the curation to pull together into something, there's still room for us there. I have no idea how much that gap is going to be filled and we're gonna be pushed out. Um, but I still haven't seen anything in all the stuff I played with where it's like instantaneous an idea. I used to, I kind of describe it like if there was a fifth Beatle yeah. who was like half as talented as Ringo, okay. you know, sitting in the corner who every once in a while threw out like a uh -huh. decent idea. Right. That's kind of where it's at right now. But yeah. it doesn't work without the Beatles still yeah. um, and, and, their, and, and that collaboration. Um, and that, that's what I've been saying. I, you see the most incredible images showing up that are better than a lot of things you'll see of, of photographs that have been taken in the 20th century. Right. But, um, and they're surprising and they're different, but 
converting that into a new type of story, a new type of an idea, yeah. uh, that step I don't think has happened yet, or is uh, far away. Right, right. Uh, do you think also, uh, you know, Walter Benjamin, he, he wrote this famous essay, um, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which I kind of like took the title of our talk from, and he also talked about, you know, the original piece of art has what he called an aura, you know, it comes from a person and everything, and do you think, it, it does feel like there's some element of that that we'll still want, you know, that if art comes from just a computer, like a movie, just knowing that fact, we feel like there's something, a spark. I think the spark is still in the in the prompting, yeah. and it's just a different, and, and in how you train the model, and right now it's not thinking for itself in any way, it's, yeah. but it's... Um, it's just mixing it up and coming up with um, an interesting new take on it. And right. um, I found that um, just, I find it constantly surprising. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good, but you do see images that are single images that you haven't seen anything like that. And that's, that to me is the yeah. wonder of it. That's exciting. And even for yourself, for anyone who's been playing around with it, yeah. you, it, it's besides being incredibly fun, and uh, very easy and giving you very quick results, yeah. you're still using an imagination to make it better and better. You're, you're totally jamming with it in the mm -hmm. same way that you would with a new type of instrument. Mm -hmm. So it's not going on its own quite yet. And, right. And uh, you know, I, I, we'll see. We'll see if it starts actually filling our needs for emotional stories. Right. I guess uh, you know, a less antagonistic framing of this uh, might be to ask you, are there things that you as a filmmaker want to be able to do, like maybe uh, that you haven't been able to do today? Yeah. That, that you're hoping technology, you know, like maybe someone in this room will build something yeah. that you want and in 10 years you I'm will already talking to a bunch of people yeah, yeah. about doing that, but sure. it's, it's about, um, you know, look, I, we spent, I've been working on this anim animated film for uh, almost 20 years now, this project. And we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing the antagonists in this, and and many years. Mm -hmm. And I got to a place that I really like, and then um, playing with Mid Journey in 15 minutes, I was just with words, without scanning any images, was able to create the same creature, looking mm -hmm. just as good, looking photo real. Right. Um, so it's pretty. If you know what you want and where you're going, it's a pretty amazing tool. Yeah. I guess, in a way, you know, directing the AI through prompt. I mean, it's like you directing yeah. your team in any film production. Um, I was, you were showing me some of those images backstage on your phone. I was like, these are amazing. They're better right. than what I've gotten out of yeah. these models. So Just maybe. gotta play around. <laughs> yeah. Not easy. Watch some YouTube videos. It carries over. Um, you've, you, you're friends with a lot of people in the creative world, Hollywood, but you also know a ton of people in the Valley, technologists. What is the number one thing that you think people in the Silicon Valley misunderstand about <laughs> Hollywood, like creatives and this oh, whole industry? That's a hard question. I think they're all over the place. Um, the ones I've met are, I, I, I was just in the, in, in Silicon Valley two weeks ago, yeah. and I was just jazzed by how, um, the minds that were up there, mm -hmm. and just how many people are thinking about the world in different ways. I was super excited by, um, I was like, oh, there's, there's a lot to, a lot of great people up here. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, many of the things I saw, I, I signed a lot of NDAs, so I can't really talk about it, but yeah. I was really just um, amazed with how far people are thinking about um, an exciting future. Mm -hmm. But I, I, are you talking about like, how Silicon Valley people get involved with Hollywood business and where the miss is on that type of thing. You know, I always, I always got the sense. Uh, most of my career, I think it was a bigger problem. problem. Like when, yeah. when, when business schools came into Hollywood and sort of tried to treat us like widgets in the in mm. the nineties, and mm -hmm. everything was a blockbuster and stuff. Um, yeah, I think there's been a lot of creative freedom lately, because, be given by yeah. all of the new tech. Uh -huh. um, because it's allowed for um, well, there's a lot more sources of money, and then there's yeah. and there's been a lot more product. So a lot of different stories have really been unleashed. What about the reverse? Are there things that you feel like oh, Hollywood creatives misunderstand about technology? I mean, you're you're so yeah. open to tech, man. Well, I, it, it, definitely, people are afraid of um, AI. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think the WGA, like in, the, in their new negotiation, is talking about um, being sensitive to what AI is allowed to do. I, I don't think the tools are powerful enough to really right. en to endanger any real jobs. It's really just, I mean, you know, it's it's more than a spell checker, but it's it's not that it's not that mind blowing quite yet. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. But but it's exciting, and as far as like a research tool, and it was a way to communicate and get information and mm -hmm. to shape and, and to get very specific in searching for information, right. and then even in structuring and getting ideas for how to structure stuff. It's very interesting, but I don't think it's taking away that the creative yeah. place of writers for a while. You've done a bunch of movies that are what I would say fall into. I mean, it's like science fiction, fantasy, high concept, what, what's next for you? Like, what types of stories are you interested in telling? Given your yeah. interest in technology, is there a, a role for that that will, like, change the I've types of things thinking, you want to do? I, I've been definitely moved. A lot of, I, it's interesting, because a lot of my films, I'm known as making these very dark films. Yeah. And a lot of people were scared of seeing The Whale because yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, and it's actually a film filled with all this hope. Mm -hmm. And I think I was making um, the films before um, The Whale. I was in a world where it was a it was a world of a lot of cynicism and a lot of materialism and a lot of um, uh, a lot of reality TV. And I was just um, always came out of a, a big green environmental background and just always wanted to point in that direction. But I feel like there's been a switch where people have gone from this kind of um, blind parting into this kind of desperateness and, without hope. And so I, I've been looking for films that sort of um, really bring light back into the world mm. and uh, paint really positive futures. We talked about right. it, like this, the kind of um, plague of dystopian movies that are just everywhere yep. in the sci-fi landscape now and how... Um, we need some more Gene Roddenberry to come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's definitely something that I hear a lot in the tech community. It's like more optimistic sci-fi. And right. what do you think? You know, stories are a form of technology and uh, are underrated in that respect. So I'm sure you'll get a lot of support from, yeah. from this crowd for that. Yeah. Um, going back to uh, Silicon Valley versus Hollywood, one one, one thing that's um, I feel like a common thread right now between the two worlds is uh, so. I grew up in the tech industry working on product, and I feel like one of the dominant product development principles in tech or frameworks is remove friction, make things easier for the user. Mm. So it's always about ease. But the paradox is in tech, we also glorify the struggle, especially like the, the romantic hero of the tech industry is the founder who wakes up eating glass and like, <laughs> like you know, persevered for years and years. and. And um, so you've made these movies about wrestlers and ballerinas who are, I would say, obsessive on the, on the borderline of like compulsive. You've made movies about people um, heavily in the throes of addiction. So there's this fuzzy line that you've explored a lot that it seems like material that interests you. And in, in tech Twitter, it used to be like every half year we would have this like a big battle on Twitter over like the balance between mental health and working super hard. And it, like, it just like flares up and everybody screams at each other and then it goes away yeah. for a bit. So based on all this work you've done with people around obsession, do you have like a philosophy towards that? Like is, right. is that the only way to <laughs> achieve greatness? Like in your filmmaking process, do you think back on the struggles as like the thing that created the meaning for you? Or like where do you it's find a good the question. line? I, I don't know. I think a lot of that it was from a romantic, youthful look at the world that it has to be that difficult. But I've seen, uh, you know, my biz biggest successes are usually the ones I work the least on. Yeah. Um, which is a strange thing. Like Black Swan, I definitely put the least amount of um, my own oh. perfectionism into it. And it's oh, really? A successful film. Why was that? Because that like a film all about this obsessive. Yeah, I mean, or either that or. Uh, the skill level of the filmmakers making it rised up so we didn't need to work as hard. Okay. But it's it's always a strange thing. I, I, I do think that um, balance is super important. I love the kind of longevity movement coming out of uh, Silicon Valley, um, people taking care of themselves and lifestyle. Um, and so I, I would just always encourage people to um, 
not to uh, throw away all those years and to lose out on um, everything else that's going on around them. Great. We have time for one last thing. I was curious about your take on, um, so Andrew Saris had this whole theory of the auteur theory. It was for a while, there was a lot of debate and the idea was basically that the director is the kind of like creative author behind a movie. We have kind of a parallel in tech. Yeah. It's just this idea of uh, this myth of the founder CEO being right. like a godlike figure. Like yeah. it's better than a CEO that comes in and replaces the founder. And uh, like, what's your view of auteur theory? And you're a filmmaker. You've collaborated with people, but you've also had to helm all these films. What's the yeah? yeah. I, look, I do think I do like films that only exist because of the filmmaker that made them. Yeah. So there are the filmmakers I like who are working today. If we were together, I would hope if all five of us had a screenplay, it would be a very different experience in each way. So that I'm always looking for the hand mm -hmm. of the filmmaker right. in that way. Um, I don't know enough about the, uh, that one driven founder visionary that gets there, but I do know how big the collaborative effort of filmmaking is. I, I have a huge team of people, yeah. but really it's about it's about it's about being a prompt yeah. that organizes that neural network right. to put out a single kind of image and vision. So we are we're kind of the gray filter. Got it. Well, thank you for coming and Thanks blessing us with your me. wisdom today. And uh, good luck at the Oscars on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.